Well, good morning, everyone. Good morning. Are you alive, alert, and awake, and enthusiastic? You are now. The microphone's working. We're glad that you're here this morning. Looking forward to our, our time together in the Word. Good time together in song. And uh, this might be a little game, so hopefully you can read lips, and then uh, we'll, just keep, we'll just keep moving along. Uh, last week we finished off uh, a series for the month of February that was really focused on Black History Month in America, and uh, we looked at uh, African people in the story of God's redemption uh, with uh, the title Hidden Figures. And last week, uh, we had a couple questions that came up during the week about the message last week because of the look at the genealogy of Jesus. We looked at the genealogy in Matthew, and uh, we traced Jesus' lineage uh, from Abraham uh, forward to, to, to Jesus, and we discovered that there were some interesting ladies who were in the lineage of Jesus, uh, Tamar, Rahab, Ruth, and Bathsheba, and one of the, the focal points of the series was identifying African people in God's story of redemption. Uh, the ladies that we looked at last week, um, probably at least three of the four of them, maybe four of, of the four of them, were women of color. And uh, the one thing that I didn't clarify last week is they weren't necessarily African, meaning that they came from Africa, but they were probably black or had some type of black in their background. So I just want to make that clear that they specifically didn't come from the region of Africa, but in light of the fact that it was Black History Month, we were looking at people of color in the scriptures as well. So I wanted to clarify that point. And then another question came up just with regards to the genealogy in Matthew uh, was Joseph's genealogy, and so how was it that Jesus had within him the blood of all of the different ethnicities in that family tree if Joseph, who was the father, was not the physical father of Jesus? Because Mary was uh, a virgin, and she conceived Jesus by the work of the Holy Spirit, so Joseph didn't have a role to play in that. So how did she have within her all of the ethnicities that were represented in that, in that family tree. Well, the Luke genealogy, uh, we believe, also is a genealogy for Mary. And if you look at Romans chapter 1, uh, I think it's around verse 1 or 2, it talks about Jesus being declared the son of David according to the flesh, which means that according to the flesh, how is that possible that he was the son of David according to the flesh? According to the flesh would be a reference to Mary, and Mary was in the lineage of David as well. And if you trace the lineage of Mary back to David, David and Bathsheba had Solomon and Nathan, and all of their genealogies get pointed to that particular point. And then all the ladies we mentioned prior to that were before Bathsheba. So it's an amazing story to kind of look at the genealogies because both Joseph and Mary trace their lineage and their ancestry back to David, so Jesus is the rightful king to sit on David's throne because of the, the line of his father and also the line of his mother because he's a son of David according to right and privilege as a son of David and also according to the flesh. That's the quick summary, but I wanted to follow that up because I got a, a, about two or three emails just saying, hey, give me some clarification on that. And so if you're still not clear on that, send me another email and I'll try to respond to that this week, okay? Clear as mud, right? All right. If you've got your Bibles, I want you to open them to the book of 1 Timothy this morning because we're going to dive into a new series, as you can see on the screen. And uh, I've entitled the series House Rules. And I don't know about you, but uh, if you come to my house, um, there are probably some rules that you would need to follow if you're going to get along at my house, right? And if I came to your house... There's probably some rules that you have in play that you want people to follow in order to get along with everybody at your house, right? How many of you have house rules? All right, children, how many of you love the house rules that your parents have established? You love them. Oh, good. Very obedient children. That's wonderful. Sometimes when we're growing up, we don't like the rules that mom and dad set in the house, and sometimes we push against those rules, but every house has a set of rules, don't they? I found a couple signs that I thought were very interesting as we think about this because there are a number of places who have house rules and then there's kitchen rules. If you use it, wash it, 
If you take it out, put it away. If you turn it on, turn it off. If you spill it, wipe it. If you break it, fix it. If you make a mess, tidy it up. There's an amen. God is working amongst us this morning, right? Then I found this one that I thought was very interesting. Two rules in the house. Rule number one, the wife is always right. Rule number two, if the wife is wrong, please refer to rule number one. And all of God's women said, amen. Amen. And all of God's men said, help. All right. (laughs) It's interesting. When we were uh, in South Africa, one of the things that uh, we did for a particular church that we were working in is we had a special day that was in the bulletin. You know, you look at the bulletin and you see all the events that are coming up. In the bulletin, it says, um, join us for the damn day. And of course, if I say that to you, damn day, you're like, what does that mean? Is the pastor swearing in church? Nope. The dam was a a place like a reservoir, right, where the water's dammed up, and they called it the dam, and so we were going to go to the dam and have a fellowship. And I might have shared this story with you before. You might might remember this, and if I I have, I apologize. If I haven't, you're going to love it, okay? So we go to this dam day, all right, And, and that's how we advertised it in the bulletin. And uh, our kids with the other kids of the church are out in the reservoir and they're swimming around and they're getting a little bit too close to the area where the boats are just kind of driving by. And there were rules that were specifically to this area and one of those rules was don't get beyond this particular point because the children and, and whoever else would be swimming out there would be in danger, right? So my kids are just getting out there a little bit, and my daughter's already smiling as I, as I tell the story, but my kids are getting out there a little bit, and uh, so I shout to them, hey guys, come back, you guys got to come in, and they're like, huh, what, what, I'm like, come in, and they're like, oh, you know, why do we need to come in, and they're like, come in, I said, you need to come in, oh, why, because it's the damn rules. And all of the congregation, the people from the church are behind me when I said that. I'm like, it's the rules of the dam. The rules of the dam. Every place has rules, don't they? They have rules to follow so that they're designed for your safety and for your enjoyment and for your pleasure and everything like that. But uh, did you know that in God's house, he has rules as well? And you might be sitting there thinking, well, preacher, wait, on, wait a second. We're talking New Testament. The Old Testament was all about rules. The New Testament doesn't have any rules. Oh, really? We need to read through the New Testament and we discover some commands. We understand, we understand some instructions that God gives for how people are to behave in his house. In fact, the theme verse of, of this uh, particular passage of Scripture, this particular book, is going to be a, book that, a verse that points to the fact that God wants us to know how to behave in his household. So I want you to stand up this morning because we're going to begin a series where we begin to look at the house rules that God has put in place for his church. So will you say this with me this morning? This is my Bible. It is the very Word of God. It is true and without error. It has authority over all peoples, in all places, in all times. Today, my heart is ready to submit to God's authority. By His grace, I will apply His Word to my life. I stand on His truth For his glory, I can never be the same in Jesus' name. I'm going to pray, and I'm going to ask you to pray. Say, Lord, help me to understand your rules. Lord, help me to understand your rules, and then help me, Lord, to obey those rules. You pray that, then I'll pray, and then we'll dive in together. Father, I do pray that you would open our hearts and our minds this morning as we open up your word. Father, we cannot understand your word unless you open our eyes to its truth. You've placed within us the anointing of the Holy Spirit so that we can understand truth that comes from you. And so I pray this morning that the Spirit would do his work at helping us to understand what your word says. And Father, more importantly than understanding it is that we would also apply it and put it into practice into our lives. So Lord, help us to see what your rules are for your house. 
and then help us to obey those rules and to follow them so that we can honor you and we can point people to Jesus. And we'll give you thanks for that in Jesus' name. Amen. You may be seated. If you follow along reading with me in in 1 Timothy chapter 1, we're going to read down to verse 11 this morning. It says, Paul, an apostle of Christ Jesus by command of God our Savior and of Christ Jesus our hope, to Timothy, my true child in the faith, grace, mercy, and peace from God the Father in Christ Jesus our Lord. As I urged you when I was going to Macedonia, remain at Ephesus so that you may charge certain persons not to teach any different doctrine, nor to devote themselves to myths and endless genealogies which promote speculations rather than the stewardship from God that is by faith. The aim of our charge is love that issues from a pure heart and a good conscience and a sincere faith. Certain persons, by swerving from these, have wandered away into vain discussion desiring to be teachers of the law without understanding either what they are saying or the things about which they make confident assertions. Now, we know that the law is good if one uses it lawfully, understanding this, that the law is not laid down for the just, but for the lawless and disobedient, for the ungodly and sinners, for the unholy and profane, for those who strike their fathers and mothers, for murderers, the sexually immoral, men who practice homosexuality, enslavers, liars, perjurers, and whatever, whatever else is contrary to sound doctrine, in accordance with the gospel of the glory of the blessed God, of which I have been entrusted. The Apostle Paul identifies himself in verse 1 as the writer of this letter, and he says that he is an apostle by the command of God our Savior and of Jesus Christ our hope, and he's writing to Timothy. And Timothy is a young believer, a young pastor, whom Paul met on his first missionary journey. And it was on Paul's second missionary journey that he asked Timothy to join him because he had grown so much in this faith, and he um, was really developing a passion for truth and a passion for ministry. And so Paul calls him and travels with him on a second missionary journey. And when he says that he is uh, the true child in the faith, there are some who believe that uh, Timothy probably came to know Jesus as Savior as a direct result of Paul's ministry. And so Paul is is traveling, doing his apostolic thing, and he's helping get churches started. He's helping put leaders in place, and he's leaving Ephesus. He's he's not going to make it to Ephesus, rather. And so he tells Timothy, hey, I want you to go to Ephesus, and I want you to stay there, and I want you to do some work for me. And so the whole book of 1 Timothy is really Paul giving some instructions to this young pastor on how to handle and navigate the church at Ephesus. And it's very interesting, um, I found this, this drawing that is really like a summary of the book of 1 Timothy. You see Paul in the upper left-hand corner saying, don't give up, I'll be there soon. And then you see Timothy, who's young, holding up a new sign that says, I'm <laughs> your new pastor. And then the people that he's ministering to are slaves down with the masters, people who are legalists who want rules, people who are questioning him because he's too young, women who are saying we need to be able to speak out, and the elders uh, and the qualifications that uh, they need to be able to serve. I love this picture. You can just imagine this young pastor being left by the Apostle Paul in this church where there's a whole lot of junk going on that he needs to contend with and deal with. And one of the things that he needs to contend with and deal with right away at the very beginning is this whole idea of warning or charging certain persons not to teach any different doctrine. It's kind of like when uh, Isaiah got his call to go into service for the Lord in chapter 6 He sees the Lord seated on a throne and sees this great vision of the Lord in the temple and the the angelic seraphim are crying out, holy, 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 and the the doorposts are shaking, the place is filled with smoke, and the Lord says, uh, uh, who will go for us? And Isaiah says, here I am, send me. You remember that passage in Isaiah 6? And then the the Lord says, uh, okay, go and do this, here's your job. And then uh, Isaiah says, how long must I do that? And basically God's summary of that is until my judgment comes. And one of the things that God tells him is that, oh, by the way, Isaiah, nobody's going to listen to you. What a job description. Go and do this, but oh, by the way, nobody's going to listen to you. 
And we kind of don't get that same sort of dark picture with Timothy, but it is pretty dark because there's problems going on in the church, and now Timothy has been sent by Paul to try to sort it out and to try to fix it and to try to move people forward. If we go further in the book of 1 Timothy to chapter 3, verses 14 and 15, we find the key verse in the entire book. And this key verse is what everything else sort of points to, and that's why we came up with the, the theme or the, the title of the series, House Rules. He says, I'm writing these things to you so that you may know how one ought to behave in the household of God. Timothy, I'm writing these things for you as you shepherd these people, as you address these issues, as you confront false teachers, as you try to deal in ministry. I'm writing these things to you so that the people will know how they should behave in God's household. God has rules for his house. He has certain things that he wants us to do. He has certain ways that he wants us to do it. And now he's tasked Timothy with this job of making sure that the people know how to behave in the household of God. And the first rule that we see in this particular passage of Scripture, I call it the rule of doctrine. Look at what he says in verse 3. As I urged you when I was going to Macedonia, remain at Ephesus so that you may charge certain persons not to teach any different doctrine, nor to devote themselves to myths and endless genealogies which promote speculations rather than the stewardship from God that is by faith. I call this the rule of doctrine. I'm going to give you a couple of minutes to answer this question and say, based on what you've just read so far, how would you answer this question? What is the rule of doctrine in the church? You've got two minutes and 26.2 seconds to talk about it with the people that are sitting around you. On your mark, get set, go. What is the rule of doctrine? All right, on a scale of 1 to 10, how difficult is this question to answer? 1 being easy, 10 being hard. 1, it's easy. Anybody higher than 1? 10? 9? 8? 5.5? It's kind of a different sort of a question because I really haven't set you up and given you a whole lot of information, right? I've just given you a little bit. I read a couple of verses to you. And then I'm asking you to explain a question that we're going to try to explain in this message this morning. What is the rule of doctrine? We're going to answer that question as we go, and then we're going to come to a, a summary statement at the end that's going to give, hopefully, a, a clear statement of how we answer that question. But rule number one in the house of God is the rule of doctrine. And we see this as Paul tells Timothy, he tells him, command false teachers to stop. He says, I urged you, remain at Ephesus so that you may charge certain persons not to teach any different doctrine. Paul is very big on doctrine. In fact, the verses that you see at the bottom of the screen are all verses in this letter to Timothy where he addresses the idea of doctrine. Now, how many of you, when you hear the word doctrine, you get excited Okay, a couple people. How many of you, when you hear the word doctrine, you're like, <sighs> wow, wow. How many of you are like, eh, when you hear the word doctrine? How many of you are awake this morning? 
I preached my first message when I was about 15 years old. Our youth group at our church, our, the, the, the youth pastor that was there at the time, he became my senior pastor and uh, the pastor of our sending church when he we went to the mission field. But I preached my first sermon when I was 15. From the time that I was saved and, until probably the, even the time that I first came to Christ, and I only came to Christ about a year and a half maybe before that. And ever since then, I've been very passionate about doctrine. I grew up listening to John MacArthur, uh, watching him on TV, and uh, I've read a number of books. My pastor, every time I graduated from high school or I graduated from college or there was a special sort of function in my life, he would always give me a book that would be good to use if I were a pastor one day. And I love doctrine. I, I, I love explaining doctrine. I love reading about doctrine. I love learning doctrine. But doctrine is a fearful word in our culture today. But do you know what the word doctrine means? It means teaching. So Paul is giving Timothy an instruction to tell people in his church to stop teaching different teaching. To stop teaching different doctrine. Doctrine that didn't conform to what the apostles were unveiling to people. Doctrine that contradicted the gospel of Jesus Christ. Doctrine that he goes on to describe later in one of the chapters, I think it's in chapter 4, where he talks about sound doctrine. He says, I want you to teach sound doctrine. And the word sound is a word that we get our English word hygiene from. It means healthy doctrine. He says, I want you to be focused on healthy doctrine, doctrine that conforms to what the apostles have rolled out, what God's word has rolled out, and stop the people in your church who are teaching doctrine that is different from that. That's a pretty big task for a young pastor who comes into a church where there were probably people who were significantly older than him who were in positions of teaching. And yet Paul tells them, get in there and tell them, stop it. Because they're teaching doctrine that is very, very different. Now, on a scale of 1 to 10... You don't need to answer this question out loud, but how important is doctrine to you? And you might say, well, pastor, there are certain doctrines that, uh, man, they're just essential core doctrines. And then there's other doctrines. We call those primary doctrines. And then there's other doctrines that are like secondary doctrines. And maybe there are some that are maybe even um, third-dary doctrines. All right? Just want to check and see if you're still awake. All right? The primary doctrines we'd say we'd take a bullet in the head for. They're non-negotiable about the Christian faith. If somebody put a gun in our face and said, deny these doctrines, we would say, pull the trigger. But there are other doctrines we would say, if he put a gun to our face, say, well, we can negotiate this one. We can negotiate this one. There's a little bit of grace there, maybe. But there are some doctrines that are so essential to the faith that if you don't affirm these doctrines, you can't call yourself a, a Christian because they're so integral to the faith. And Paul was concerned about this false teaching that was rising up within the church that he sends Timothy and he says, hey, stay there and take care of this. Now, we don't have false teaching in the churches of Jesus Christ today, do we? We don't. I mean, we're, we're perfect this side of the New Testament, right? We got everything sorted out, everything figured out. Here, I want you to take a little quiz. Pull out a little piece of paper and write your answer down. There's three questions. That's all it's going to be, three and you're going to say whether or not you agree or disagree. You can say yes, or you can say true, or you can say no, or you can say false. Are you ready? And if you want to just do it mentally, do it mentally, okay? You don't need to, the pressure of writing it down. It's like, I can't, I can't write it. I just need to think about it. Just relax. Just take the quiz, okay? Here we go. Question number one. Do you believe Jesus is the first? Don't answer it out loud either. Do you believe Jesus is the first and greatest being created by God? Yes, you agree. No, you disagree. True or false? Ready to move on? Question number two. The Holy Spirit is a force, not a personal being. Yes, you believe it. No, you don't believe it. True statement, false statement. Ready to move on? Last one. Question number three. People have the ability to turn to God on their own initiative. Yes, you believe it. No, you don't believe it. True statement, false statement. You got all the answers tucked away in your head? Or on your piece of paper? What's the correct answer for these? 
Question number one, Jesus is the first greatest being created by God. Did you know 52% of Americans agree with this statement and 67% of churchgoers agree with this statement? This is false. It's called the Arian heresy. John chapter 1, verses 1 and 2, in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was God, or the Word was with God, and the Word was God. He was with God in the beginning. That's a reference to who? Jesus. Colossians says that everything was made by Him and for Him. Jesus is equal with God. He is not created by God. And yet, a survey that LifeWay Research did said 67% of churchgoers say he was the first and greatest being created by God. Question number two, the Holy Spirit is a force, not a personal being. 56% of Americans agree with that. 63% of churchgoers agree with that. Use the force. Oh, no. This is not true either, right? Whoop, sorry. I went too fast. This is not true either. And this has a big word uh, that is used to describe this particular heresy that begins with the, the Greek word pneuma, which is the word that we translate spirit or breath from. But it's a heresy. He's not, he's, he is a personal being. He's not a force. In those passages in John where Jesus promised the Holy Spirit was going to come, he said, Jesus said, when he comes, he will guide you into all truth. The personality of the Holy Spirit. The Scripture says that we can grieve the Holy Spirit, and you can't grieve an impersonal force. You can only grieve someone who has personality and personhood, and the Holy Spirit has all of the divine attributes of God the Father and God the Son, and so therefore, if God is a person and Jesus is a person, the Holy Spirit is a person as well, right? You got 100% so far? Question number three, people have the ability to turn to God on their own initiative, 79% of Americans believe this. 85% of churchgoers believe this. And this is one that we might just go... <laughs> it's not true. Ephesians chapter 2, verse 1 says, we are dead in our transgressions and sins. Verse 4 and 5 talks about the fact, but God made us alive in Christ. And Jesus said, no one can come to me unless the Father draws them. I don't have the ability to choose God on my own because I'm broken and I'm depraved and I'm fallen. I can only choose God when God opens my eyes to that and draws me in. How'd you do? Did you get 100%? You get, what is that, 30%? 60%, 90%, a third? Interesting stuff, isn't it? This is called the rule of doctrine. Command false teachers to stop teaching different doctrine. But look at what he says here. There are a number of false teachings that we could probably identify that's going on in the world today that would be relevant to what Paul is talking about here with Timothy. But he says, charge certain persons, that is, command certain persons not to teach any different doctrine, nor to devote themselves to myths and endless genealogies which promote speculations rather than the stewardship from God that is by faith. I remember when I first started taking classes at Grand Rapids Seminary, I used to sit and listen, and, and I, it took me a while before I started taking seminary classes because my pastor had always told me he, he, he didn't want me to go to seminary and lose the fire that he saw in me because he knew a lot of seminarians who basically it's all ivory tower, uh, just these big thoughts that we think about, but then we don't really live out our faith. And so he really discouraged me from seminary for, for a while. And, uh, and I remember when Sarah came to, to fetch me one time, I think after class, she was doing some student teaching. We were getting ready to go to the mission field. You know, she came in and she was waiting for me and she heard these guys talking about something, some theological truth. But this, the, the conversation that was going on, it was just like this endless conversation that didn't lead to any conclusion, nevertheless, any practical way to put it into practice. 
And she's like, wow. She says, are all of your classes like that? I said, no, they're, 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 they're better than that. They're much better than that. And it's not bad to talk about theology. It's not bad to talk about doctrine. It's not bad to have healthy discussions. But the goal of doctrine is to lead to practical application where people put into practice the truth that they are wrestling with, right? If we're just teaching doctrine, but it doesn't make any connection to people's lives, then we're really wasting our time because James said we're supposed to be doers of the word, not just hearers. So Paul tells Timothy, stop these people from teaching different doctrines, but that could be a very hard job. Have you ever said to somebody to stop doing something? And how do they respond when you tell them to stop? Who are you to tell me to stop? What do you think you're doing? Yada, 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 yada. Well, I got well, you and... It can be a very difficult task. And even sometimes the way that we do it can be very, very difficult. Hey, idiot, stop what you're doing. We'll get a different response than, hey, you know what, can we sit down and talk about this? Because I don't think that's the best way to do it. Right? Two different ways to approach it, and you will get a, a much different response. And I think Paul's aware of that because he goes on to say here, not just tell them to stop it, but he goes on to say, Verse 5, the aim of our charge is love that issues from a pure heart and a good conscience and a sincere faith. So the goal of this command that he's giving is that it would be done out of love. The Bible says that we are to speak the truth, but we're also to speak the truth how? In love. See, here's the thing that I find about God's rules. Even in the Old Testament and in the rules that get translated to the New Testament, God's rules flow out of the very character and the heart of who God is. In fact, the law of the Old Testament, we see the righteous standard of God established. And we see that nobody can reach that righteous standard, which was the whole point of giving the law in the first place, was to show people that they can't do it and they need a Savior. And hence, Jesus coming many years later, to provide the salvation that the law pointed out that people desperately needed. He said love is the goal of the command. And any time God gives us a command, any time he gives us a rule, he has his glory at stake and our good intended with that command. And so he's not telling Timothy to go in there with guns blazing and start shooting up the place and saying, okay, stop, you stop, you stop, you stop, you stop. He said, remember, the motivation for this command is love. Love. Love that issues from a pure heart, a good conscience, and a sincere faith. How do we do that with people? How do we lovingly tell somebody what you're teaching is wrong? What you believe about the gospel is wrong? Do you know we still have people in gospel-teaching churches, Bible-believing churches, that believe that you can be saved by doing good works? And some people would even say, you can be saved by trusting in Jesus and doing good works. But you can't add anything to that. It's just trusting Jesus. You can't add anything to it. If you add anything to it, you haven't really trusted Jesus. We need to be careful of that because we're talking about souls are at stake here. Eternal destinations are in, hanging in the balance by the way that we present the gospel, by the way that we talk about the gospel. And if there's anybody in our church that would believe that you can get to heaven by doing good works, that's not because the pastors have been teaching that. That's a, a, a fault in our understanding of what the scripture says because at Southgate, we don't believe that. We don't believe that we get to heaven by doing good deeds. We're not going to do this little tap dance number and say, what do you think, God? Am I in? He's going to say, depart from me. But we take all of our brokenness and all of our depravity and all of our sin and we lay it at the cross and we say, God, forgive me a sinner. And he says, here's my righteousness. Boom. Boom. You're in. It's not because of anything that you did. It's because of what I did for you on the cross. 
That's what we believe at Southgate. And so love is the goal of the command. And the third thing that we see in this particular passage is that correction is the result of the command. Love is the motivation for it, but correction is the result. Look at verse 6. He says, certain persons, by swerving from these, what are these? Well, look back at verse 5. A pure heart, a good conscience, and a sincere faith. Certain persons swerving from these have wandered away into vain discussion, desiring to be teachers of the law without understanding either what they're saying or the things about which they make confident assertions. These people are ignorant, Paul says. They don't know what they're talking about, and they're saying things with confidence. Oh, that's how the false teachers operate. You turn on uh, any sort of broadcast uh, gospel-based programming, and you can identify very quickly who the the true teachers are and who the false teachers are. And it's hard sometimes because the false teachers, man, they communicate very well and very dynamically and very powerfully. And a lot of people follow them. But it's not through these persuasive words that determine truth. It's not because they're excellent speakers that determines the validity of what they say. What determines the validity of what they say is how much of what they say conforms to what God has revealed in His Word. And there are people who are sharks out there who are trying to lead people astray. And Paul said that was happening in the church at Ephesus. Not on TV. Now, obviously, they didn't have TV back then. But not in social media, but in the church that was located at Ephesus. And Paul says, tell them to stop it. Remember that it's love, but remember that the result is correction. Because it says that they've swerved. They've departed from the truth. He says, we know the law is good if one uses it lawfully, understanding this, that the law is not laid down for the just, but for the lawless and for the disobedient, for the ungodly and the sinners, for the unholy and profane, for those who strike their fathers and mothers, for murderers, the sexually immoral, men who practice homosexuality, enslavers, liars, perjurers, and whatever else is contrary to healthy doctrine, in accordance with the gospel of glory and the blessed God with which I have been entrusted." The result is that those who have swerved from the truth would be brought back in line with what the truth says. Swerving is very difficult, isn't it? It creates a huge reaction in your body. If you're driving down the road and there's something that jumps out in the road in front of you and you swerve, man, everybody in the car feels it, right? You're like kind of peeling your face off the side of the the window. But to swerve back is going to be equally hard sometimes. Paul says, Timothy, tell them to stop teaching this different doctrine. Remember, do it lovingly because that's the goal of the command. But the result of obeying this command is that those who have swerved off and followed after all of these things that are contrary to the gospel, they would be brought back in line with the truth of God's word. I think that's why Paul goes on in 2 Timothy chapter 3, verse 16 to say that all Scripture is God-breathed and is profitable for what? For doctrine for teaching, and for rebuke. Rebuke is when somebody comes and says, you've sinned. You've done it wrong. Here's the way. Correction, training in righteousness. Here's the way to go. Paul's telling Timothy to do that as a young pastor in a church that has all sorts of problems. So how would we answer this question, what is the rule of doctrine in God's house? The rule of doctrine is a loving command to teach healthy doctrine and stop false teachers. That is the rule of God's house. If we want to be in the church, which is God's house, the pillar of truth, we need to lovingly preach sound doctrine and lovingly confront people who are teaching false doctrine. That's rule number one in God's house. So let's make the connection. How important is doctrine to you personally? How important is doctrine in your family life? How important is doctrine in the life of your church? And let's maybe, if you don't like the word doctrine, let's, let's just use the word teaching. How important is healthy biblical teaching to you? If I were to stand up here every Sunday morning and I were to open up the Springfield News 
or the Dayton Daily News or any other newspaper or Time Magazine or U.S. News and World Report, and all I did was talk to you about the news headlines, and I never opened up the Word of God and pointed you to truth, I would be teaching you false doctrine. Because anything that I teach is doctrine. I'm thinking about starting a donut eating class because I think that Christians err in the way that they eat donuts. I think there's a correct way to do it. If they're in front of you, you just eat all of them. That's the correct way to do it, all right? If I were to have a class and had a sign up that you could go online and sign up for Donut Eating 101 with Pastor Bobby, we could sit down and I could show you how to eat donuts. We could get even creative and spectacular, and I could show you how to dunk them, okay? Now, anything that I'm teaching you with regards to donuts could be considered doctrine, because that's what doctrine is. It's teaching. So now we have the doctrine of donuts. It's found in second hesitations. You can go and look it up later, but it's, a, it's an important doctrine. But how important is doctrine in your personal life, in your family life? More importantly, what is the connection between your doctrine and daily living? Paul goes on to tell Timothy, and we'll look at this later. He goes on and says, watch your life and doctrine closely. What does that mean? If you believe this, then how does it affect your behavior? Oh, I'm a believer in Jesus. How does it affect your marriage? How does it affect the way that you parent? How does it affect the way that you serve at work? How does it affect the way you serve in the body? How does it affect every aspect of your life? Doctrine, the teaching of the Scriptures, should affect us in the way that we behave. Last question, how closely do you watch your life in doctrine? Oh, I know a lot of Christians who are guilty of just slipping, we call it. Oh, Lord, I'm, I'm slipping. Oh, preacher, I'm slipping. I just not really... And, we just have this drift that takes place sometimes. Oh, we need to watch our life and doctrine closely. We need to evaluate ourselves. We need to ask people, hey, what do you see in my life that needs work? What do you see in my life where I need to shore up my understanding of the gospel? Doctrine is very important in the Scriptures. And Paul, as he writes this letter to Timothy, he lays out the rules of God's household. And rule number one is the, doctrine, is the rule of doctrine. I'm writing these things so that you may know how one ought to behave in the household of God. And as we go through this series, we're going to learn how to behave in the house of God. And for many of us, we've read through the book of 1 Timothy before. For some of us, it might be the first time. But the end result is moving through this book is that we would not only understand the rules, but we would put them into practice so that we can be the people of God. Will you bow your heads with me in a word of prayer? Father, we thank you for today. We thank you for the book that you've given to us called the Bible. And we're thankful for the book of 1 Timothy and for the instructions that Paul gives about how to behave in your household. And I pray that as we move through the book, you would in fact help us to understand the rules, obey the rules, so that we can honor you and we can point people to Jesus. And Father, if there's anybody here that doesn't know Jesus as their personal Savior or anybody listening on the internet that doesn't know Christ, I pray that they would come to the conclusion that there is nothing they can do on their own to earn your salvation that they would understand that Jesus did all of the work for them. All they have to do is believe and put their trust in him. And Father, help us to be a church that perpetuates this gospel because it is glorious and it is amazing and it is life-transforming. And we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.